Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati Podcast. Tonight, we're joined by George Selgin. George is a senior fellow and director emeritus of the Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives at the Cato Institute and professor emeritus of economics at the University of Georgia. His research covers a broad range of topics within the field of monetary economics, including monetary history, macroeconomic theory, and the history of monetary thought. If you enjoy this interview, please don't forget to like the episode and subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to check out our website, futuratipodcast.com. Dr. Selgin, thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, you're very welcome. It's nice to be on. Let's hear a little bit about your background, your interests, and what brought you to working on the problems that you're working on today. Well, my background, uh, at least some of it, is that uh, I'm an economist. I have a degree from New York University, PhD, and uh, I've been working on monetary economics most of my career in uh, some fashion or other. But my particular interest has always been what uh, markets can accomplish in money. That is, uh, to what extent you can have monetary arrangements where the government doesn't play any prominent role. It might play a, a basic role as it does in, in most industries, in all industries these days. Uh, but, uh, but otherwise, the provision of money is left to market players, to, to private businesses essentially banks obviously and others as well and uh, i've been exploring uh, how that works or how it can work including drawing on historical uh, examples where <laughs> when you can find them when i can find them of systems that produced money privately and learning how they work so that's my my thing obviously it uh, ties in uh, a lot to uh, current issues. These days, that's important because uh, I uh, retired from being a, a university professor about eight years ago now, almost, uh, to work at the Cato Institute here in Washington, D.C., where I'm speaking from, uh, where I am a policy wonk. <laughs> so so I'm, uh, despite my uh, somewhat uh, theoretical interest in private monies, I'm also very, very much engaged with uh, in uh, current policy issues, Federal Reserve policy, and inflation, and uh, and all that. And cryptocurrency is a big part of it. So that pretty much sums up my background. So when people talk to you about um, uh, kind of the way the economy works, what's the most common two or three things that they get wrong? that there's there's these underlying assumptions that I'm sure that drive you crazy because they, they don't quite understand how it all works. Just two or three? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Well, I, I'll just focus on the one that I think uh, I find most frustrating, but it's also not at all unusual, and it isn't particularly naive uh, still, <laughs> Uh, that's the view that you can only have monetary order, uh, everything from coins to monetary units to paper currency, if someone imposes it from above, if the state more or less says, this is what you all shall use as money. Right. And everything, uh, uh, the, the idea that you can have order in society generally, but particularly in payment systems, right? Money is just the most uh, obvious component of payment systems. The idea that that those that can be orderly, that uh, such arrangements can be orderly, even though the order has to come from below, as it were, uh, has to develop uh, in a private market setting with people just doing voluntary stuff together. That is something that many people, including experts in my field, 
don't get or don't get as much as I think they should get. <laughs> right. They get it. And uh, and it's especially a problem with with uh, legal scholars. If I had to pick on any particular group, uh, I, I, uh, I, I wish they would be more like anthropologists who have a little bit more used to thinking in terms of how things happen from, as it were, <laughs> ground level up. Right, right. So that just sounds like a generalization of the general idea of, of catalactics to monetary issues, right? Which strikes yeah, me so as... Yeah, of course it is. That's, that is exactly what it is. And uh, that shouldn't be a big deal, but it is because that application is the one that economists have most neglected of all the realms, of all the industries, of all the things that we want to be orderly in society. We pretty much know how markets can deliver, not necessarily deliver uh, in the best way, but we know that markets can, after some fashion, give us food, right. <laughs> give us cars, give us communications, give us railroads, give us all kinds of things. But when it comes to money, uh, uh, a lot of people's minds come to a screeching halt <laughs> and, they're, right. and they're unable to conceive of how the market is going to handle it even even in a so-so fashion it, it seems like that's just a general problem P people don't imagine that markets can provision these different things and the libertarian literature is kind of rife with examples of what might happen in a counterfactual world where the state had provided shoes and then can you imagine what a market in shoes would be like and it, it's not hard to walk back from that and say well no i mean we just take it for granted that markets can do those things and i, I think just it's a failure of imagination in many cases uh, when yes, people, people, yeah, people just imagine that it's not possible for a decentralized process to provide good X, Y, or Z. Uh, Herbert Spencer said this very well back in the mid 19th century. He said, "If if the state had always produced bread, right, and people knew of no other arrangement, it would boggle their minds if somebody said to them, you know, we could just do this." you know, in a decentralized way, they right. would say, are you kidding? That could never work. Well, that's what's happened with money. States started taking it over and, and, and for the most part did take it over in ancient times when there was only coins. So you didn't, that's all you had to take over. And subsequently they've, uh, <laughs> they've managed to uh, muscle in on paper currency. Now they're talking about muscling in on electronic money. But the point is that they've always bustled in on important components of monetary systems, and therefore they've made it difficult for people to imagine what things would could be like if they didn't muscle in. And it takes a lot of imaginative, rational reconstruction to right. try to tell us that story, and some evidence, which there is, from those cases where the government stayed out for a change. We have to gather as much of that as we can find. Uh, the scholars who are working in this area. But then when you do all that work and you piece it all together, you still face a great deal of skepticism from people, a lot more than I wish there was. So it's it's an uphill it's an uphill slog. So is that is that what you anticipate with the cryptocurrency world? Is that the governments will muscle in? Well, uh, they they are muscling in. Yeah, yeah. they are muscling in. They're muscling in with a central bank digital currency. We haven't done it yet, but uh, there is now a huge movement uh, pressuring central banks everywhere, including the Federal Reserve, to issue its own uh, digital currency. Now, <laughs> depending on which scheme you look at and who's behind it, these may not be genuine crypto digital currencies. But they're meant to be, at very least, substitutes for uh, uh, private market stable coins, particularly, uh, some of which, of course, are based on distributed ledgers. And uh, so that is muscling in. Um, and in my opinion, it's the stable coins rather than the free floating digital currencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum that probably are going to prove the most important for exchange purposes, for ordinary exchange purposes. Not to say those others don't have their own importance in different uses, 
or that the blockchain doesn't have uh, much wider applications besides currency, uh, uh, besides exchange, indeed. Uh, 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 so, but I think it's if if we're talking about where governments are trying to muscle in on cryptocurrency, it's as uh, issuers of digital, so-called digital central central bank digital currency which could displace or uh, at least uh, uh, is meant to uh, be a substitute for uh, stable coins denominated in their currencies. How do you feel about that as a development? How do you think about the potential of central bank digital currencies? Well, I, I, I am opposed to the idea, uh, and I have written about it. I... Uh, I think that it's a bad idea for all kinds of reasons. Uh, now, I should step back a little bit and make clear that I favor competition in currency in as many forms as you can have it. And uh, that you might think that would uh, incline me to favor having the Federal Reserve, for example, compete head on with issuers of dollar based stable coins. But there are two problems with this. First of all, at least up to now, the Fed is uh, handicapping its the private issuers of stable coins to the extent that it's not making it easy. In fact, it's making it very hard for them to gain access to the dollar settlement system that it runs. So stable coins are out in the cold, as it were. They managed to. They have managed to uh, a considerable extent to uh, gain substantial market shares, but that's only because the banks aren't, for the most part, uh, anxious to deal with crypto cr cryptocurrency exchange or exchanges. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, what I'd like to see is the Fed open its facilities. Uh, to stable private stablecoin issuers that aren't necessarily banks, to allow them to have master accounts, to allow them to settle on its books, which is really the best. The 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 the, the way you really have a sound stablecoin is to be able to give the issuers direct access to the final genuine fiat money that they're fixing their own stablecoins to. And that way they don't have to rely on correspondent banks and that sort of thing. And uh, we could uh, have, a, as, as it were, a more legitimate set of uh, private stablecoin issuers. The other problem with the Fed's uh, competing with these private firms is that it, it can't compete fairly. Mm -hmm. Even if it admits, admits them to its clearing and settlement system, even if it does that, if it's also issuing a rival digital currency, the problem is that uh, it has all kinds of ways to cheat and it can hardly help doing it. It regulates its rivals. That's a big <laughs> problem. Right. Who wants to compete with their regulator? Who wants to uh, worry whether the regulator is going to uh, give them a hard time in some enforcing this or that rule? inspecting it, et cetera. There are all kinds of ways the Fed can discourage a rival through its regulatory clout, through not approving a, a merger or who knows. And they do it all the time. Mm -hmm. More importantly, the Fed can't fail, no matter what it does, even if it's got a new operation like a digital currency that is actually a money loser not competitive, not efficient, worse than other products. It can always stay in business. It's got plenty of rents to draw on. Its seniorage is enormous. It just has to subsidize whatever the product is. And it can do that and will do that rather than fail. We never see central banks entering a business and then saying, oops, we can't compete, we're leaving. Especially if they spent a few million to get in there. Right. And I say, if, if a competitor or a would-be competitor cannot fail, it can't really compete, and it shouldn't. Right. So when you pass the laws and you print the money, there's no reasonable sense in which you're actually competing on anything like a fair footing. That's right, because you can't lose. Yeah, there's no downside. 
There's never any downside, and you can keep going with implicit subsidies forever. And uh, that is not that's not competing. So I'd like to see competition, but I'd like to see it among the private firms, and I'd like to see them be able to compete the private fintech stablecoin issuers, the non-banks. I'd like to see them be able to compete more fair and square with banks by having the same access to the Fed, but not by being regulated in the same ways because stablecoin issuers don't take the same risks banks take. So they, many of them don't need deposit insurance and shouldn't have it. And I've read, written about that too. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be some regulations. The most useful would just be to have the Fed make sure that they're holding the reserves that they say they're holding. We know how important that could be. Right. But that's really easy to do if the reserves consist of balances at the Fed. <laughs> right. How can the Fed not know? And if the Fed knows, everybody knows. Yeah. yeah. Do you see the the banking system working with cryptocurrency in like 2030? I think, yes. The answer is, if it could happen if the Fed is indulgent in the way I've suggested to other stablecoin issuers. What will happen, the non-banks will then be uh, dealing with cryptocurrency exchanges, etc. They'll have a rival product that has a certain appeal. And at a certain point, the banks are going to say, look, you know, we want to get in on this too. So we'll see more regular banks, full-fledged banks, also start to deal with those exchange changes. And I think we'll see the regulators be a little bit more tolerant of it. But you've got to first drive a wedge in the status quo, as it were. Because what we have right now is a gigantic sort of firewall that's separating the banks and the ordinary dollar payment system from anything that has to do with crypto and is allowing and is allowing uh, or having these stablecoin issuers that are themselves not integrated with the banking system, with the ordinary dollar payment system, sort of floating out there on their own, trying as best they can to have dollar substitutes that are viable. And some of them are succeeding better than others, of course. But we need to break down that wall if we're going to have a an efficient uh, digital current digital dollar system. I wanted to ask you a similar question. If we make the unlikely assumption that Jerome Powell at the Fed is not avidly reading George Selgin and, and taking his cues from... from I have your, a story about that. I'll tell you in a minute. Yeah. From your scholarship, how do you see the Federal Reserve moving forward with uh, central bank digital currencies? I mean, you've, you've, you've stated you don't think it's a great idea. What do you think is actually going to happen, though? Well, uh, first, the story. I I was invited to the Fed's uh, annual shindig in Jackson Hole a few years ago, which was itself quite unusual, um, given my my views and all that. <laughs> and it wasn't until the very end of the event that um, I finally had a chance to go and introduce myself to Powell, who I hadn't met. And so I did. I started walking up to him, and I'm about to put extend my hand, and he looks up. And he says, oh, George, I've been wanting to meet you. <laughs> and, and sure enough, he knew who I was. He's a, he's a, a, he's a very charming man, yeah. he says. Uh, and uh, I have no idea whether he's read any of my stuff. But he, but he knew who I was, Interesting. Uh, sure enough. And I was completely discombobulated, of course, because I was expecting the conversation to go the other way. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I, first of all, uh, speaking of Powell, I don't think the Fed really wants to do this. I really don't think they want to do it. And if it were completely up to them, if they were truly independent, I wouldn't be worried that they would. But the pressure is immense from various groups uh, for them to do something. And there are all kinds of reasons for it. There's people who hate private stable coins, and don't want to see them proliferate or succeed. There are people who worry that because uh, China, especially, but also some other countries are going ahead with their own government uh, or central bank digital currency schemes, that the Fed has to keep up with them. 
uh, otherwise we, the U.S., will fall behind in our payments technology. My response to that is, look, you've got four or five countries that have developed digital currencies, and you've got a bunch that have not. Why don't we keep up with the other? Right. <laughs> right? Why do we have to keep up with China? Because it's done it. Why can't we keep up with Britain, which hasn't done it? <laughs> so they might they might also. So um, so there is a big, big uh a movement out there putting pressure on the Fed and other central banks to develop uh, their own digital currencies. And I'm afraid that <laughs> that uh, that it might ultimately succeed. Uh, but I'm trying my best to, to do what I can to prevent that from happening. Uh, so uh, what would it look like? Well, the Fed has already put out a plan which it says uh, is not something that is a plan in the sense that it's planning to do it. It's just saying, here's what we probably would do if we had to, if we were told we have to, or (laughs) if we decided to. But I think they mean if we had to. It was not a very well thought out plan, which I think is just more evidence of the fact that this is not something the Fed is terribly enthusiastic about. But what it described was a sort of... uh, franchising arrangement, I've called it, where the Fed issues digital currency, but to avoid having to actually have the customer dealings, which is something the Fed, you know, is really not at all equipped to do retail business. It would treat other banks and perhaps some non-bank payment service uh, 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 providers as franchisees, where they would create they would, uh, as it were, uh, kind of uh, act as custodians. So you would go to your local bank and you would make a deposit, but you would say, I want this to be in the my Fed digital currency account. And so really you would then be holding a Federal Reserve liability or promise to pay directly the bank that you deal with is only helping you to uh, with the management of an account that is really your account with the Fed, but at uh, this private local bank. That's how they want it to work. And uh, there's no, by the way, there's no cryptocurrency or distributed ledger in any of this. Right. It's plain old deposit banking, but it's the Fed doing it. And it's, it's one variety of what they call digital currency, but really it's not currency at all. It's it's a, it's a deposit account. They call it digital currency. What they mean is it's stuff that uh, is put out directly by the Fed, like paper currency. Right. But it is deposits. You you still you swipe a card and all that. I suppose you'd have a Federal Reserve debit card. You, I don't think there'd be any credit <laughs> <laughs> from them. All right. And that's how it would work. Um, it, 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 so so it, occurs, know. it occurs to me that, you know, most managers, most administrators, their job is to contain things. Their, their job is to manage things. And it's much easier to do their job if you don't have the disruptive people underneath that are trying to unleash things. And yes. the creative people are always trying to unleash something new, and they're trying mm-hmm. to, and and that therein lies the rub between those. Um, in in your your best way of thinking about this, w- what does this evolve into 10, 20 years from now, like two thousand forty? The what does the Fed do? Does it also have cryptocurrencies under management? Um, uh, is is it extended out to uh, lots of other things beyond what it's currently doing? Well, who knows? But I think this Fed will stick to dollars. <laughs> I think the dollar is the Fed's business. I don't think it really cares that much about other stuff. It it does talk about the possible destabilizing effects of non-dollar currencies, of course, uh, including crypto, right? Uh, you know, if something bad happens to Bitcoin, what repercussions could... The, so to that extent, they're concerned with it, but they're not going to take it over. The thing they want to run is the dollar. And the problem is that they want to 
uh, they want to uh, limit substitutes, direct substitutes for the dollars. That is dollar. That is dollar denominated substitutes, and 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 they want to do that for the most part by keeping it to the traditional bank supplied substitutes, insured bank supplied substitutes. That's that's uh, what they want to do, and so talking about the future, what I see and what I dread is that the Fed having monopolized paper currency would monopolize digital alternatives or preclude them by issuing its own. And so we end up with a lot of people having accounts at the Fed uh, indirectly. We don't have a well-developed private stablecoin industry. Uh, we might uh, see some substitution out of paper currency into these Fed accounts, and that that you know I have I I don't feel any great nostalgia for old-fashioned paper currency, which the Fed has monopolized for a long time now. Indeed, uh, I think one of the problems is that because it monopolized the paper stuff and prohibited banks from issuing substitutes. They never messed around with trying to compete again. And it was only these uh, digital currency outfits that have done an end around with digital currency, right. coming up with new, still legal, circulating substitutes for the dollar when the banks had been told not to mess around with the stuff anymore. Years ago, with paper money, I mean. So anyway... Um, uh, I, I think the biggest problem of this scenario that that you got me talking about, so I won't sleep tonight, <laughs> is that <laughs> the biggest problem and the biggest difference between having the Fed do it all or most of it and having a dynamic, competitive private industry where different firms are competing is is in the future of innovation. And the way to look at it is this way. This is how I, I try to sum it up. Um, the, the, <clears throat> in another hundred years, I could see us, if things go the wrong way, looking around and saying, gosh, why are we still using this old-fashioned digital currency? <laughs> and the answer will be, well, because the Fed's taking it over. That is why we're saying right now, why are we using this old-fashioned paper currency, which, by the way, is hardly different from the you know the oldest banknotes? It really hasn't changed very much. They've got more anti-counterfeiting devices, of course, but they need that because central bank currencies get counterfeited very aggressively for for all kinds of reasons. I probably shouldn't go into, but uh. they're very tempting targets for ta- counterfeiters. So, so I would like to see us have a dynamic, innovative payment system. And that means firms competing and being able to innovate and not have any, you know, a grand master looming over them that wants to take over. I really like that. And I find that a very compelling vision. So let's stay with that thread and kind of broaden the conversation a little bit. In your, in your paper, Financial Stability Without Central Banks, you argue that it's possible to achieve a stable financial system without this centralized entity making all the rules from the top down. So could you walk us through the basics of that vision and why you believe it wouldn't be just this endless chaos that would be incredibly problematic? Well, uh, sure, I'll try. Of course, it's a, it's a, it's an involved point. It's not the sort of thing you could uh, capture in a soundbite. But the first step in understanding the argument is to appreciate, which many people don't, the extent to which financial crises, both recent and uh, historic, uh, are have been uh, made uh, possible or made worse by stupid regulations. Not to put, put too fine a point on it, <laughs> but uh, it's incredible how once you go looking into them, uh, into the record uh, closely, You'll find all kinds of uh, of uh, regulatory misfires that contributed to major financial crises. Uh, I'll just give you an example that probably is the most important. Um, 
the 1930s in the United States. Of course, we had uh, the Great Depression, and a proximate cause of that was the collapse of our banking system, where in you know, a matter of a couple, three years, we lost 5,000 banks. Now, that's an incredible number. So the first thing you have to ask is, how many banks did we have? Right. And the answer is that going into it, we had about 29, 30,000. How come? Well, first of all, no other country had anything like that many banks. We had all these piddling little unit banks because we prevented banks from having branches, not only nationwide, but often in the same town, let alone the same state. I see. So we had the proliferation of huge numbers of highly uh, uh, undiversified banks with only local loans. In those days, you couldn't sell loans very well, et cetera. And um, it was mostly the ones in agricultural areas, not in the cities that were going belly up because of first because of collapsing farm prices in the 20s. In fact, thousands of banks failed before the depression in the 20s. And that just kept happening and got worse in the 30s until the whole thing uh, imploded. So the lack of branch banking alone was a huge factor, the prohibition, I should say, of branch bank, because it wasn't natural. Oh, didn't let it happen. That didn't really end until Regal Neal in 94, right? When they repealed It didn't completely end. That's right. It started to get phased out before. But what happened, what kept unit banking alive in between was insurance, deposit insurance, which was adopted. uh, uh, The law was passed in 33. It started in 34. And uh, that law, everybody understood this at the time, and they've forgotten since. That law was only passed to prop up a a banking, a unit banking system where everyone now knew how bad these banks are. How are you going to get them to keep their money in these banks? If you open them up and they're the same as they were before, that's not going to do it, right? Right. right. So insurance is a, is a, a way to jury, deposit insurance was a way to jury rig unit banking. And, and no wonder We were the only, well, there was one other country that had deposit insurance before us. I think it might have been Czechoslovakia. But apart from them, nobody did it because nobody thought they had to do it. Then the next country that did it was Canada, 1967. And they had no good reason to do it. They weren't having any, you know, problems with their banks uh, to speak of. There's a history, there's a politics behind that story as well. Right. So... Not to get into too much uh, of the weeds, the the point is governments regulate their banking systems or monetary systems for all kinds of reasons, and some of them are really bad. And often the result is they create problems, weaknesses, instability. Then you have a crisis, and then they do more of the same, right? Rinse, wash, repeat. And so we keep getting new layers of regulations heaped on top of the old ones that were troublesome to make up for them. And then we find we've created other problems. So step number one, check and see whether the panics are caused by bad regulations. And often they are. So all you have to do is to identify them. You get rid of all these bad regulations or you envision a system without them. And you're already pretty much halfway there to stability without central banks, because what central banks are doing in their last resort lending operations, which is the main their main ideal contribution to stability, not their only one, is uh, making up for uh, the the panics, et cetera, that break out because of the private market, because the uh, conventional banks have uh, uh, gotten into trouble, often because of regulation. I'll give you one more historical example. And this really speaks to the lender of last resort's role of the Fed. Uh, before the, uh, during the Civil War, uh, we abolished or pushed, forced state banks out of the business of issuing currency. And uh, that was done mostly for financial, uh, fiscal reasons. Uh, because the government wanted to issue a lot of paper money and it wanted to create a new national banking system that would help it with its finances. And if they didn't have some scapegoat to get out of the way, 
to get out of the currency business, they would have had even more inflation than they actually had in the Civil War, which was plenty. Anyway, they also created the national banking system, and the national banks were allowed to issue currency only based on U.S. government bonds because they wanted to sell bonds, because right. they wanted to finance the war. So now we have a currency tied to the availability of these bonds. More bonds, more currency. Fewer bonds, less currency. Okay, go ahead uh, the next few decades after the war, the government's retiring its debt, the bonds are getting scarcer, the banks can't afford to issue more currency, even though there are periods when a lot more currency is needed to move the crops, etc. So <laughs> there were two ways to fix this system. The first way was deregulate. And people said this, they pointed to Canada, which had a great de decentralized currency system. They said, look, if you just let the banks issue notes without that bond requirement that is no longer needed, the war's over, we're running surpluses, then they can issue more when they're needed. And that was the proposal. Get rid of the restraint. Get rid of the dumb regulation. But for reasons I can't go into, the government didn't do that. I have a whole paper about this, a whole uh, long paper. Instead, uh, they set up the Fed. Now, what was the magic of the Fed? Simple. The Fed was allowed to take assets that the banks had other than their bonds that the banks could not use to back their currency. The banks could present those assets to the Fed and discount them, and they would get some Federal Reserve notes, mm. and then they could issue those. All this was doing was creating a set of banks, the 12 Fed banks, that were exempt from the regulation imposed on all other banks and letting them fill the gap that way. There was no magic in it. Right. Uh, you, you guys ever see the, the movie Misery with Kathy Bates? Yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> right, so... so uh, James, the James Caan character, his car crashes and she rescues him. But she's a big fan of his because he's a famous novelist. And he's in bed with a broken leg or whatever. But once he starts getting better, she realizes she won't have her, you know, uh, her, she won't have the, her hero around anymore. So she hits him with a sledgehammer, breaks his legs all over again. That's kind of what how we regulate. We break the, we break the legs of the private marketplace that's otherwise capable of doing something. Then we create a government institution and it, you know, comes to the rescue <laughs> by doing what the government won't let the private market do. So uh, 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 we really didn't need the Fed in 1913. Canada didn't need a central bank then. It got one in 1935, but not for the, again, political reasons, a whole different ones. So, um, once you start look, getting rid of the bad regulations, you really do away with a lot of things that make a central active central bank necessary. Now, that doesn't completely solve the problem. So let's suppose we have our nice, intelligently regulated, that is not very heavily regulated, private banking and currency system with no central bank, and the banks are doing their thing, et cetera. And Somehow, for no reason, doesn't have to be a reason, people start panicking here and there and they start running on their banks. Right. Well, you can have a thing called an option clause or suspension of payment contract. In fact, banks have used this. These Some banks have them now, though you never know it unless you read your contract's fine print. Mm -hmm. It says, we reserve the right to pay, we'll pay you either on demand or in so many days with an interest penalty. And it's easy to show you can design those contracts so they're incentive compatible. And what that means in non-technical language is that uh, it's only in the bank's interest to invoke them when the bank is sound. But that means that for the customer, as soon as the contract's invoked, they know they shouldn't have panicked in the first place. And this gives you a good equilibrium where nobody ever panics and it solves the problem. And you can, you know, uh, so there's a lot more to this, but 
between the actual history of what causes panics and how much you can accomplish by just getting rid of the bad regulations that contribute to them and the various market devices that banks could use to protect themselves in the event that things funny things happen you can have a very very stable system with no need for a central bank I wanted to ask you a somewhat technical follow-up. But you made a passing remark about there being periods of time during which it was necessary to increase the currency supply to move crops. Mm -hmm. And my yeah. understanding of the quantity theory of money is that over a, not even that long of a time span, production in the economy can a, can acclimate to any amount of money, right? That, that money, it just doesn't matter how much there is. And so- In the long run, yeah. How long does the long run have to be for that? So, it so can like, be a long time, yeah. A long time? So, that's right. Let's be clear that, um, yeah. So <clears throat> what was happening in the 19th century and still happens today to some extent is wasn't that there were periods necessarily when everyone wanted money of all kinds, more money of all kinds. But what would happen is in those days, especially, it's less true now, there were times when having uh, deposits was all you needed. You could write checks, etc. Uh, and your need for actual circulating money was low, banknotes, currency. And then other times when there were more transactions that required currency, like moving the crops. And the reason you needed a lot of currency that then was because the migrant workers who, far, who, who helped with the harvest, generally they went from town to town and so they didn't bother keeping bank accounts. Well, because there was no branch banking, they'd have to open an account, close it again every time they moved. So they just dealt with cash. So that time of year, you needed a lot more cash. In a well-regulated banking system, the banks would just say, okay, you know, you don't want my deposits, you want some currency here, have some banknotes. Doesn't matter to them. It's two different kinds of IOUs, you see. But if they can't afford to issue more currency because of some stupid civil war regulation that makes it necessary to buy bonds at a premium, then it's, and then you have, you're stuck with them because uh, uh, the currency demand goes down afterwards, and now you've got the crummy asset that you shouldn't have bought, you're not going to do that. So what do you do? You might hand out legal tender, you hand out specie, and now you've got to contract credit because you've got fewer reserves, because you couldn't use your own IOUs to satisfy the need. That's all that happened. So this wasn't a question of now. If you now now let's talk about the quantity theory. So now what's happening is the total money supply is actually shrinking, mm -hmm. right? Well, you could say, well, if prices will just go down proportionately, what's the problem? We'll be right back in. But it doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen except in Murray Rothbard's book. They're, they're sticky. They're sticky. They take time uh, to adjust. And uh, and the same and, and, and this is why the idea that I think uh, I think it was David Hume, it might have been James Mill, that the quantity of, I think no, it was John Stuart Mill, the quantity of money is a thing of, you know, of complete unimportance in the sense that any quantity of money can be sufficient if you have the right price level to go with it. That's true. But that's a statement about, the long run about comparative statics. It was never meant by Mill or any other economist even back then. It was never meant to, to imply that if you if the money supply shrank in half, we wouldn't have to worry about it. Right. <laughs> or, or that yeah. if it doubles, you don't have to worry about it. As they say, uh, I think, uh, uh, I don't know which wag said it, but uh, the Niagara River is smooth at the top of the falls and smooth again at the bottom, but the transition's a real bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. that. That's great. Yeah. So that, that's the way to think about the quantity, you know, the, the idea that in that eventually any change in the nominal money stock can be equilibrated or adapted to through an appropriate corresponding change in prices. Yes, that's true. But the transition's a bitch. Yeah, can can you talk a little bit about the the transition we've been through with the monetary supply during COVID, um, and and what what long term effects will that have on society? Mm. You mean the monetary changes? I assume, yeah. not COVID. <laughs> I can't answer right. the broader question. Right. Well, it's been an interesting event because um, during COVID, 
really two things were you had one big thing going on you had uh the disruption of production and activity by covid and uh, uh that meant people were spending a lot less and it also meant supply was disruptive so supplies of goods were uh reduced and and that problem lasted well after the activity uh started to revive now if people are producing fewer goods, there's less output. That's putting upward pressure on prices. Uh, but uh, during the COVID uh, period, when it was bad, when we were doing lockups and all that, because people were spending less, that was putting downward pressure on prices. Right. In fact, <clears throat> during that time, the velocity of money, so to speak, was it just completely collapsed because pe people were just not spending. Right. Now, the Fed at that time, quite properly, increased the supply in an effort to make up for the collapse in velocity. People get more money to hoard, but it's not really doing that much to, to, to uh, uh, offset the decline in spending. As the recovery took place, two things happened. One was, of course, spending picked up again. Right, the new money that was out there, and the old started right. to to get used, and this was all right because, uh, to a large extent, what it was doing was uh, allowing spending to catch back up, so that we didn't need to have much deflation. Uh, so up to a certain point, the big expansion of the money supply post COVID was perfectly desirable to avoid the trend, the bad kind of deflationary transition. Uh, and beyond that, to a point, actual inflation was desirable or not a bad thing, because uh, since goods were not being produced in as great quantities or weren't available for other reasons, bottlenecks, what have you, you would expect even with fairly stable, with the recovery of spending, but no more, you would expect higher prices reflecting scarcity. And that's pretty much where things were right up until I think the end of last year. Because at that point, around that time, spending fully recovered. And, at, and then it started to go beyond where the trend it had been before COVID. And at this point, you can say the Fed is fueling undesirable inflation, inflation beyond what the supply shortages justify. And that has become clearer and clearer in, uh, uh, since December. I was arguing back then that it was already time for the Fed to start put, uh, hiking rates from uh, the low level they were at at the time, essentially zero. And uh, now, belatedly, the Fed looks uh, is is probably going to raise them at, at last by just a quarter of a percentage point. Um, I think that if the Fed does what it had been planning to do before the Russia thing, before Ukraine, uh, and raise the uh, federal uh, raise the target several times this year, perhaps in all by a percentage point or so, it would probably be doing what it needs to do to contain inflation. But now what's happened with the Ukraine affair is yet another round of adverse supply shocks, right? More scarcity of goods, especially oil and some other things. And that's going to continue for some time based on what's happening with our trade with Russia. And so uh, in my opinion, that means the Fed will have to tolerate, we'll all have to tolerate more inflation. We'll all have to be ready to allow the Fed to let inflation continue at somewhat high rates without blaming it because it, we don't want the Fed to try to combat inflation that is not due to excess spending. That actually will make us worse off because then we'll have scarcity of goods and scarcity of money and they don't cancel out. Okay. 
Well, it sounds like just a lot of fun coming down the pipe for us all. Oh, yes. I mean, that this whole last few years have just been, you Delightful. know. Delightful. Delightful. <laughs> yeah. Very a lot. The, the big challenge with all the inflation, though, is people that are on fixed income just of course. Um, yeah. get Murder. squeezed between a rock and a hard place. And there's just. Yeah. And um, uh, although I do. But remember that when the Fed tightens, nominal earnings go down. So <clears throat> the people on the fixed incomes, they uh, they are OK as far as their earnings. And so they may be better off because prices are not rising so much. But everybody else is going to be paying a price and seeing their incomes grow less. And so um, and 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 it's also the case that many people on on fixed incomes have cost of living uh, 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 you know, uh, adjustments for inflation. So uh, we have to be very careful about this. In general, uh, when goods are in short supply and prices rise because of it, you add injury, you add insult to injury by having the central bank try to keep those prices from rising because it's got to reduce everyone's earnings to do that. And that 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 actually uh, doesn't make people better off. So, so I, I like to think about um, Bitcoin was a direct response to the 2008 monetary crisis that um, that people just um, well, one person in particular actually decided to do something about it. Um, so moving forward, thinking about uh, how things are going to transition in the future, in, in your uh, with your best future thinking hat, what comes after cryptocurrency? Oh my goodness! Now you, yes, you guys are into this future stuff, aren't you? <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm not so good at that sort of thing. Of course, I'd make the netty if I could be. I, um, but um, so you're asking me what the next big innovation beyond cryptocurrency is going to be. Is that the question? Yeah. Well, I think. Uh, <laughs> well, well, to to manage expectations a little bit, it, it could also just okay. be what what you think might come through cryptocurrencies. Like maybe it's not Bitcoin or Ethereum. Maybe it's something else, a stable coin that achieves global. Yeah. Do we get a uh, cryptocurrency version of FDIC or something? <laughs> oh, those things I. I'm even worse at because once you get out of the money realm, I become a complete idiot. Um, but uh, but as far as uh, what I see is this. It, let me step back a little bit and say, uh, first of all, talk a little bit about the past. The cryptocurrency has uh, has really fulfilled some past visions of what uh, the future might be like. So let's talk about those first. When uh, Friedrich Hayek wrote uh, Choice and Currency in 1976 and then followed it up with uh, denationalization of money two years later, he right. was contemplating private issuers of fiat-like monies. He didn't call them that, but private issuers of currency where the value of the currency would be um, re regulated or somehow deliberately and the appeal of the currency was going to be by whatever uh, 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 the regulator or the whatever how, however it was designed, and you know, and whether that seemed to give it better prospects of stability and all that. Hayek believed that the most popular private currency would have the most stable value, and of course, watching Bitcoin, we see something that I had already. Uh, uh, raised as an issue against Hayek's theory, which is that people like appreciating things. So right. what they might like is is a, is a money that appreciates, except they might not use it as money that much if it does. The opportunity they'll, cost would be higher. They'll be hodlers, so yeah. it will become an investment act, asset. So, so um, in a way, what Bitcoin has done, because we never saw private issuers of fiat, of paper money, right? We never saw what Hayek actually envisioned. But the closest thing has been stuff like Bitcoin and Ethereum, where the values are independent of established currencies. They're regulated in ways Hayek couldn't have anticipated, right, with algor algorithms mm -hmm. and all that. 
uh, but uh, where they differ is that they don't have stable purchasing power in terms of goods and services, and they tend to be especially uh, um, favored by people who, who hope that they'll appreciate, as, as they have to a considerable extent, since their foundation, of course. Um, so the other vision, old vision, was the free banking vision that I and Larry White and Kevin Dowd had, where we're thinking about private currency that's redeemable in some established money. Well, we know the banks, for the most part, have been taken out of that business for a long time. Here come stable coins, right? During this end around, stable coin issuers, they're not banks, they're not issuing paper currency, but they're non-banks issuing digital currency. So it amounts to the same kind of thing, except it gets around the regulatory restrictions. So for me, and I think that's true for Larry too, we see this as uh, this was our future once upon a time being realized. So um, what does this all mean? Well, in my opinion, it's as far as exchange is, as far as media of exchange, as far as money are concerned, the future is in the stable coins. Precisely for the reason I mentioned earlier, that the non-stable coins, the private independent currencies, the Hayekian uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are mainly appealing as investment media. The prospect of appreciation is much more important in driving the market for those things than the prospect of being able to go shopping with them. Right. That's all there is to it. That wasn't the intention of Satoshi and his friends when they developed Bitcoin, certainly. Uh, I think they did have in mind that it would become money in the economist sense of a widely generally used medium of exchange. But it has become something different. And unlike some critics of it, I don't see this as a bad thing. It's just, you know, we, I think I wish people would just stop talking about Bitcoin being money. It is a medium of exchange for certain purposes and an important one. It's a niche medium. Um, but even in and, and, and so uh, it's particularly used for certain kinds of transactions. It's especially used by people who need privacy for their transactions for good reasons, bad reasons, whatever you think of reasons. Uh, and it's um, more likely, of course, to be used in places where ordinary exchange systems, payment systems break down. But a lot of people, I think, exaggerate how widely it'll be used as currency, even in these basket case situations. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing some of this in Russia. We've seen some use of crypto in, in Venezuela. Uh, but often, typically, uh, you see the dollar or other media taking over when the domestic currency fails. Russia is a unique case right now. So let's talk a little bit about that. Because what what's What's happening there is not just that their ruble payment system, the ruble is collapsing and the ruble payment system is collapsing, uh, but that uh, they don't have access to dollars and other currencies. So they really being, as it were, uh, locked out of not just they don't just have a problem with their own home currency. They're being locked out of the usual substitutes, right. which, you know, the first, the first, the, the main usual substitute is the dollar, it might be the euro, be some other reasonably stable, established official money. But we're not letting them have those, right? right? So they can't have anything. That leaves gold. That leaves Bitcoin. Now we're seeing those things that are usually just hedges, mostly in investment vehicles or niche currencies. We're seeing a situation where their use in exchange is probably going to be unusually important. But it is a very exceptional case. And I think it's a temporary. I hope it's a temporary case. I don't think the future of money generally is in those kinds of cryptocurrencies. Can I ask you a follow-up to that? Sure. So I've been reading a lot about the monetary properties of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin in particular recently. And Vijay Boyapati makes the case that historically, 
when a commodity becomes a money, it tends to go through a couple of different stages. First, it's a collectible, then it's a store of value, then it's a medium of exchange, then it's a unit of account. Probably not quite as tidy as that picture, but the general contours. I've seen, I've seen that picture. Yeah, I've seen that. Mm-hmm. Right. And so the idea is that owing in part because demand for Bitcoin is very volatile and the supply is limited, you get a lot of uh, price elasticity. And so the opportunity cost of using it as a medium of exchange is very high right now. And that if someday it stabilizes, there's no reason it couldn't be used as a medium of exchange. Do, do you buy that story or do you think it's... No, no not, not at all. all. Okay. No, no. I've seen the picture and I've seen the story and these. it's a nice story, but I don't think there's any basis for it at all. It just uh, sounds good. Uh, I think that the, the the real problem with anything like Bitcoin becoming currency is that, for, for of course, its its value may stabilize. Uh, it, its volatility will go down as the market for it expands. That part's true. But <clears throat> what <clears throat> what what isn't true is that uh, that will make it uh, considerably more appealing as an exchange medium. The most important factor that drives monetary choice for ordinary exchange, ordinary day-to-day, you know, go buy your groceries exchange, is the size of the established exchange network, which of course is going to determine what your grocery store is prepared to take from you. It's as simple as that. This is a case where uh, once you you get an equilibrium with a well-established currency that everybody is using, that thing is very hard to nudge away with any rival. And uh, that's where we are certainly with the dollar. The dollar is the most entrenched of all monies because it's got a market that extends, not only includes pretty much, you know, uh, all but a trivial component of domestic US uh, exchange transactions, uh, but also a lot of the transactions in the rest of the world. So it's huge. It is going to be very hard. The Chinese aren't going to unseat the dollar, no matter what they do, and certainly not just by having a digital yuan. Uh, and so Bitcoin is not going to do it either. Bitcoin's market share is is tiny, and that share isn't properly measured. You, even if you look at you look at its capitalization compared to the dollar, it's tiny, tiny, minuscule. But the capitalization isn't a measure of how much it's being used for ordinary exchange. That's the measure. That's the measure of the network size that you have to compare with the U.S. dollar network size. And that's even more minuscule compared to what the dollar has. And so even if the inherent properties of Bitcoin, its stability, its portability, uh, whatever, its convenience, the fact that you can send it, you know, across the world for nothing, None of these things trumps established network size. And that's the thing about currency uh, choice that uh, I think a lot of Bitcoiners have simply uh, not recognized. And, and frankly, a lot of them think that just having the capitalization go up is the same thing as it's becoming money. And that's not at all true. Those are really quite different things. I remember you and Saifedean Amus got into that rather a lot in your Soho Forum debate. So, yeah. <laughs> I, so, so I, I totally buy that the network effects are enormously yeah. important. I mean, arguably, that's crucial to the definition of a money. It's a commodity that's accepted on one side of every exchange. So the network effect is kind of the, the whole value prop. Do you yeah. think that... I mean, do you just do you just not see a world in which the dollar gradually loses its place in that world and and Bitcoin could cultivate a separate network that gradually captures more and more market share? Or or do you think it would be bad if that happened? Uh, Is it possible? It would be bad. I think if it happened, chances are that it would be good because there'd be a reason. Right. But uh, but I don't see it happening. You know, this network thing, it's not. it's not it, it, it's not the sort of thing the equilibrium tends to be all or nothing right we either all use dollars or we all are using something else because if half of us are using dollars and half of us are using something else we haven't got as an efficient uh, an exchange medium as we would as we should have as we'd like to have right the tendency is for one thing to beat all the others this, of course, was Menger's famous theory of how 
uh, money spontaneously evolve. And I've done work on that theory. I've done computer simulations with Peter Klein and all that. And you can show how uh, just by people, you know, uh, trying to guess what's the most widely used medium so they have the best chance of shopping successfully, you could start out with, uh, you know, all, all kinds of potential candidates and you end up with just one. I actually used to do an experiment in my money and banking class where um, <clears throat> you have a you have a, an, a, a, a one bag or urn and you put 10 jelly beans, each of a different color in it. And then you have another big bag with all these jelly beans of all different colors. And you pass the bags around the room and you ask each student to draw from the almost empty bag, blind, pick a color, and then double replace from the other bag. And you do that, you know, till there have been 200 draws. And then I'd have them pass what was the empty bag or almost empty bag to the front of the room. Now it's full of beans, jelly beans, and I dump it on the desk. And of course, what's gonna happen is, even though nobody's picking any color on purpose, is that one color is going to totally dominate, and that's the that's the Mangarian story. This is people sampling the market to see what's popular already in exchange, but doing it you know dimly. They don't you know, and, uh, and over time, by replicating, by being copycats, you get the spontaneous emergence of a dominant medium of exchange. That process doesn't reverse very easily. That's the thing. Kind of a one-way street, right. Chinese finger trap. Uh, it can reverse if, for example, let's say <clears throat> you have uh, two countries that are separate and have formed their separate monies, and they decide they're going to merge and have a single country. Then you start the horse race again between those two currencies, but you're still going to end up with just one for the same reasons. So this is why I say that unless something really weird happened, uh, that the dollar uh, is that's pretty much going to be it's, it's it, it entrenched for a good long, long, long time. And here's another fallacy that I run into. People say, well, you know, it's losing 5% a year or whatever, 2% even. And so uh, eventually <laughs> it's going to become worthless. It's, no, it doesn't work that way. I have to remind people that you can lose 10%. Something can fall in value 10%, 5% forever. It never becomes worthless. We might have to re-denominate and that kind of thing. But it, 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 it's not the case that every time the dollar loses 5%, that it's getting that much closer to being unacceptable and therefore is bound eventually be replaced with something else. That's that's a common another of those common fallacies you asked about. That's another one I run into. It seems like this would bear on your comment earlier about the possibility of market mechanisms arriving at stable currencies. If it's really true that these network effects dominate all the other underlying properties of a currency and that there is just a tendency for one to become what everyone uses, right? Like, yeah. like that, that would militate against the idea that there would be monetary chaos without us, without the federal reserve. Like eventually one of the gold or, or one of the, the paperbacks will end up being the currency everyone uses. And you'd get a measure of stability as a result of that. Well, yeah, but, um, of course, uh, the fact that there's only one uh, currency in the end doesn't guarantee that whatever it is, is being has a supply that's regulated in a desirable way. You could be very unfortunate and end up in a situation where the horse race gets won by a lame horse somehow, <laughs> and and uh, and then you're stuck with it. You know, uh, now as it happens, uh, the precious metals, for example, uh, worked out reasonably well. And I'm always one to to defend the gold standard, particularly as having been much more stable inherently than people assume. They confuse the banking crises due to other causes, like those bad regulations I've been talking about, with in inherent problems with the gold standard, which they wouldn't do if they simply bothered to compare different countries that all were on the same gold standard and note that they didn't all have the crises, right? right. 
Uh, so, but they don't do that sort of thing because it's too much trouble. So, um, so, uh, but commodity standards, of course, just to focus on them, are all imperfect. You can have discoveries, you can have instability due to uh, changes in non-monetary demand for whatever the stuff is. Uh, and so there are issues. One of the things that made me an early fan of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin in particular, but cryptocurrency more generally, was the possibility that you could, after all, try to have one regulated by an algorithm that was so smart that it gave you just the perfect result. Now, this is all, of course, uh, just uh, hypothetical. In fact, it uh, turns out that while it's apparently not, not that hard to get an algorithm that'll spit out a certain number of coins until you've got 21 million uh, at a, a rate that uh, is more or less constant, you, they've solved that problem. Coming up with cleverer alg algorithms, macroeconomically prettier algorithms, let's say, uh, that would make for a good cryptocurrency that really could be currency. That's still uh, a, a nut that hasn't really been cracked. They have got some algorithmic ones that stabilize in terms of other currencies, of course. Right. And even those have not always worked the way they're supposed to. So I wanted to tie together a couple of these threads by asking you about deflation. And your paper, Less Than Zero, makes the case that contrary to popular and academic opinion, deflation is completely consistent with a growing, thriving economy. And I want to know a little bit about how that works. But my first question is one that I've, I've kind of been scratching my head over for a while now. I, I can't figure out why anyone ever thought that you have to build inflation into an economy. So uh, Russ Roberts on Econ Talk asked this to John Taylor the other day. He talked about how you need to keep inflation rates in sync between different countries because you don't want it getting out of control and that can cause disequilibrium. <laughs> but I, I don't know about the more fundamental question, like wh why, why you would want price inflation at all. Why is that the prevailing opinion? Well, let me go back to the question about deflation, first of all. It's important to recognize that my point, my argument in that book isn't that deflation is fine. It's that deflation can be fine. Right, right. It can be fine when it's caused by uh, uh, productivity, uh, exceptional productivity growth. And that's just the inverse of what I was saying before. If you have less supply, if you have supply shortages, it's desirable to let prices rise to not try to prevent that. Right by contracting the money supply or money growth. In the converse is that if productivity is robust, why not let goods get cheaper because they are cheaper in real terms. The, the unit costs of production are falling. Let's let their prices fall along with it. And I think that more and more macroeconomists are starting to uh, appreciate that. There's actually now a substantial literature supporting that result. A as there was, a long time ago before the Keynesian and monetarist thing happened. Right. Uh, because there were used to be plenty, there used to be plenty of economists who understood this, this point back when, uh, uh, but they all died. So, um, uh, so that's the general point about deflation, that it can be good and it is indeed healthy in a, in a, in a economy that's growing rapidly enough. So how did we get to this world of 2% inflation? Right. right. Uh, being treated as, as if it were uh, the bee's knees. And I, I think it's a long story. First, the monetarists uh, uh, got up there and said we should have a perfectly stable price level, which is already, in my opinion, a fallacy. It'd be true if productivity were constant. Not, It isn't true in reality. But so then how, somehow we got from 2% to, from 0% to 2%. And uh, this happened it, it kind of uh, insidiously. It was just this idea that that's been around also a long time, that a little inflation kind of greases the wheels. And also was the thought that deflation is always so bad that we can't possibly risk it. So let's give ourselves a little 2% cushion. Right. But again, it, it makes no sense because now... Let's say you have robust productivity growth that would nor would would could justify having a slight deflation like one percent. 
if you were doing a zero inflation norm, you would have thought uh, you'd only be 1% off. Now you're 3% off. Now, there is another factor, though, that has kicked in that is reinforcing these arguments for 2% inflation and even uh, supporting arguments for moving up to 3 even 4%. And that is the fact that interest rates have fallen. Real interest rates have fallen a lot. Uh, since the 2008 crisis. And if interest rates fall, uh, as interest rates fall, then uh, a lower inflation target can be dangerous uh, because uh, you can get m more occasions where the Federal Reserve is stuck at the zero lower bound and can't ease money anymore by reducing interest rates because it can't go negative. Now, at least so far, it hasn't tried. Right. Now, I've written about this. It turns out that if you do what I say in less than zero, where you let the <clears throat> you target nominal spending and let the inflation rate vary, you'll automatically have the very circumstances that would tend to produce low interest rates, uh, <clears throat> real interest rates, uh, low productivity and low interest rates go hand in hand. They tend to go hand in hand because productivity is the major determinant of the real rate of interest. So if productivity is low, my norm says then you should have a little more inflation, right? If, but if it isn't, my norm says you should have a little less. So my norm would avoid the zero lower bound but not at the price of always having 2% inflation or always having three. It would have higher inflation on those occasions when it served to keep interest rates from hitting zero, but you wouldn't have it all the time. And so I think that uh, the real problem here, the real problem with 2% is really the pro same problem with 0%. It's a failure of economists to understand the circumstances in which the rate of inflation should be allowed to change, to vary, uh, and those circumstances are related to the state of productivity in the economy. Right. And I shout it from the rooftops, and I've, I've gotten a few people to listen, but not enough. I, maybe I'm not giving the arguments enough credit, but it just seems to me as though this is an instance in which these brilliant academic economists are missing a very basic economic insight, namely that prices aggregate information and communicate uh, communicate about the economic conditions which, which which are underlying them, right? Like like this this is how you know there's a scarcity. This is how you know there's a surplus, and they they mean something, and you can't just they, change them. They get that. What they don't get is that there are occasions when the general what they call the general price level actually needs to change to signal underlying real change. They don't get it because they're they, they they don't they aren't sufficiently conscious of the fact that the thing they keep calling the general price level is what the thing they call uh, the general price level is measured in practice by things that are measuring consumer prices, which are not all prices. Right, right. There's also factor price. Mm -hmm. So when you have a technology change, what does that mean? It means that factor prices are changing all of them. The relative level of factor prices must change relative to the output price. So, for example, when technology improves, that means that the relative price of output is falling relative to the price of uh, uh, the price of outputs falling relative to input. Inputs produce more output. So yes. output gets cheaper relative to input. Now you have to choose then. If you are stabilizing the output price level all the time, no matter what. Under those circumstances, you're destabilizing the input price level, which turns out, I mean, you're not improving information that way. In fact, if the input prices are stickier, which they tend to be, like labor, right. you're making the prices work less well to signal the necessary change. Well, I, I think we have uh, gone over here and taken too much of your time already. We really appreciate it. Are there any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Oh, I guess we've covered enough, fellas. Uh, but uh, <laughs> when you do, if you do have to uh, edit away some of my remarks, uh, uh, just make sure to cut out the most stupid ones. And leave it <laughs> <up>. <laughs> Only the stupid ones. Got it. <laughs> yeah, this, this has been great. Dr. Selgin, thank you so much.
Thank you. I'm, I'm very, very, very glad to have had the chance to talk to you both.